Woof woof and namaste. This is Hill Dog and welcome to Kana Cast, a series of conversations with visitors and residents of Kana Shantivana, the International Center for Heartfulness. Today I will be speaking to Dan Hansen. Dan is a memory expert and an author. He's also a heartfulness meditation trainer and he's someone who I've always admired for his approach to spirituality. For those of you who don't know, heartfulness is a meditation technique that is offered for free by volunteer trainers around the world. It was earlier known by the name Sahaj Marg or the natural path. One of the specialities of heartfulness is meditation with the transmission of a very subtle energy. Since there will be a lot of reference to heartfulness in this talk, let me just fill you in on the heartfulness guides. The first guide was Lala ji, then there was Babu ji, from 1983 to 2014 Chari ji was the heartfulness guide and uh, from 2014 to the present day Daji has been the heartfulness guide. You will also hear the word master very often in this talk. Master can refer both to the heartfulness guide or to the inner master or higher self that is within us and all around us. This definition depends on the individual and his journey and it may differ from time to time. So we're here with Dan and uh Dan the way we've been doing these conversations is uh you know we uh, get into an introduction because usually I know very little about the person I'm interviewing but in your case of course I I know you uh from a long time Dan and I go back a long time actually I don't know if you remember but we once shared a hotel room in Rudrapur I don't know how <laughs> long back that was that was really a long time ago hotel some hotel in Rudrapur and we shared a hotel room <laughs> but our association has been with heartfulness basically it's heartfulness that brings us together yeah definitely and uh i don't know much about your life outside heartfulness mm. i don't know much about uh you know what you do and stuff like that so could you for our listeners could you tell us a little bit more about what you do yeah man uh, first i'll talk a little about my past because i actually feel like i have lived two lives in one life my first life was before the journey before i met charity the previous master right and uh, that uh, drastically changed my life before that i was very active in pol- in politics i was a candidate for the european parliament when i met him the first time and i'm an economist by education so i'm a i could have an academic background my approach to life was also very uh practical so i'm not grown up with any kind of religion or spirituality or any belief system so where did beyond... you grow up then where were you i mean i'm grown up in uh, in a small village in south denmark near the german border um and um at some stage in that journey i started wondering uh what they are not telling me about in this life here because i knew there's something more than this uh, we can grab and feel there's something behind but i didn't know um, nobody spoke about it and i didn't know how to ask for it and even if i had known what to ask i mean there would have been nobody who could have told me anything so in the beginning i had a little superficial uh journey but quite dedicated actually journey trying to find out what this diffuse thing was so i researched a lot on ufo's i mean i must have been 10 or 11 years old right I researched on uh, UFOs and Pyramid Force and Loch Ness Monster and Area 51 and, and all that. Yeah, all those things that uh, people thought that was a little uh, mystical or magical and uh, I mean it's uh, definitely um, you get in contact with that uh, wonder um, about life right. So in the beginning it that was uh, the journey that um, If I'm looking back I can see that's what I was searching for but I got into politics because of my family also my samskaras was like that so I was very active for 25 years um until my heart couldn't do it anymore it was tough right it, uh, any I'm sure any politician will also uh, sign to that statement um and my heart couldn't do it um so I had to find another way but it was also charity who kind of I, i don't know if he pulled me out in the in the neck or in the ear from it um even every, every time i asked him he said keep keep stay in politics because that's what you're good at several times i asked him 
So it was kind of a, something that finished inside myself, which, uh, which I had a really big respect for. Because in the beginning when I started, I was very thorough in checking value systems. Mm-hmm. Because I was in politics, I didn't believe any spoken word, frankly. I might still not do that, actually. Because I've heard all the napkin speeches, right? Where people, they will say all the nice things. We should share, the world should be happy, peaceful, everybody's equal. Then you go in the food line and they will push up front and they'll eat whatever yeah. food is there and leave everybody else empty-handed, right? Everybody's equal, but some <laughs> some are more equal than others. That's what I call a napkin speech, right? It's quickly <laughs> written and it's all the right words, but there's yeah. no uh, content in it really, right? Sure. So, But I believe in behavior. I believe how people they behave. That's how I evaluate the situation, right? Of course, in the beginning, you have to take the words, but um, we easily find out if that's uh, real. I mean, do you walk the talk or mm-hmm. don't you? I mean, so it's much easier to talk than to walk, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm also like that. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned you got into politics because of the family, right? Yeah, I would think so. And uh, was there was there any other uh, motivation to be in politics? And yeah, I mean, Spirit, the spiritual journey and the political journey, it's its rooted in the same uh, motivation. It's about uh, creating a better world and create a better version of yourself and other people. I mean, it's the same driving force that is behind. But somehow my world, it was broken in two halves literally, like, because people in politics, they didn't think much of people in spirituality and people in spirituality in general didn't think much of politicians. So if I invited for parties or stuff like that, I mean, uh, maybe if there were 100 people, 50 were in spirituality, 50 were in politics, and they didn't mix also, right? Those must have been odd parties. I wondered, (laughs) Rudy, I really wondered about it, right? Yeah. How come my life is like that, where it's broken up in two halves? And then at some stage, um, after four years of campaigning, I just burned out in politics. I mean, the experiences there was... uh, heartbreaking in many cases, right? So I simply couldn't continue. So So you mentioned the motivation uh, was similar, and the motivation is, of course, to help people, to make a difference, to make a change. Uh, Did you find that uh, conventional politics wasn't being able to do that? It is definitely doing it on an economic and a practical level, right? Obviously, politics matters a lot when it comes to that. But uh, you make laws because people break them, right? It would be better if it was not needed to make the laws in the first place, that people by character or moral, they just followed the the right uh, aspect, right? But since many of us are greedy or uh, predators, whichever word we found more correct, um, we'll try to exploit some situations. And that's why you have to create rules. And also distribute wealth for that matter, right? And uh, now we see situations around the, in the world, right? How uh, big nations, they are trying to dominate weaker uh, nations. Sure. And that's, of course, an ongoing, more or less visible journey that goes on the whole time, right? I think everybody knows that. But I wanted, you know, I wanted to, to make a change, right? I, um, I wanted to leave this world in a better place than when I came. I wanted to contribute to that. So in the very beginning, the reason I started in politics was actually because of environment. But now we are talking 35 years back, right? Mm -hmm. That I realized at that time, it's completely unbalanced the way we are living. And we cannot keep exploiting nature and animals in the way that we are doing. But there was not that much understanding at that time. So very fast, I got into international politics. Because very fast, I also realized environment is not a national issue. Sure. It affects all of us. Yeah. If you pollute, it will drift somewhere else. If you create greenhouse effect, it's not a national issue, right? Mm -hmm. Atomic nuclear, I mean, we had a big nuclear power plant near Copenhagen, which was built in Sweden. And they put it just uh, up against the, the neighboring country's capital, right? Something that would never have happened if you had had proper international cooperation, I would think. So there were so many examples where it was quite clear it can't be handled on a national level. Sure. But it's like that in many fields also when it comes to crime, right? Or wars and refugees. And I mean, it's not a national issue. It becomes a global issue. 
Absolutely. Poverty is a global issue, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So was there any, any particular one time in politics where you thought that this isn't for me? Or did it was it a feeling that grew over time? If there were any specific situation where I said, this is not going to work. Mm, yeah. Or was it just something that over time uh, your experience told you that this is not the place for me? There was a moment... Um, you see, I, I really respect politicians. I mean, in Denmark, where I come from, and the Europeans I had in contact with, in different countries, it's different behaviors, right? Some places there are a lot of bribes and uh, killings or, I mean, extortion. I don't see that at all in Denmark. Frankly. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's, it's, uh, it's good to understand that uh, in Denmark, where I grew up, politics is not... It's a jungle, right? The strong wins, right? It's sure. the jungle law. And it is a kind of a war for power, right? But um, you don't have the physical expression as you see in some other countries. Yeah. And um, it's a so it is a little ideas more. Yeah, it's a little innocent, I would say. Ah. So all the people that I grew up with, and uh, I mean, the. The youngsters I spend my time with now, they're uh, prime minister and different, uh, whole different ministerial posts, right? So the party I supported in those days, I guess still I do, um, they're in government now, right? So if I had walked that path, if my heart had made it possible, I might also have been minister today. Who knows how things would have panned out? Mm. So there was one incident after the, I was candidate for four years, right? And uh, I remember there was a um, party congress where a couple of thousand of the top most active people in the party were there, right? So that meant you had the prime minister and all the big ministerial posts. You had a lot of, I mean, our party, we rule all the big cities, right? So there were a lot of mayors, all the big uh, um, unions, the leaders are also supporting this party, right? So there was... Uh, a huge power base of the country, they were there present in that one room, right? And at some stage, I was also there as a, uh, as a, a participant, right? At some stage, I decided to go on the back benches and I climbed up and I was just sitting and looking out over the audience, a couple of thousand people maybe, right? And then I started with the prime minister and maybe I was around 30 in those days and average age was maybe in the 50s, mm -hmm. let's say. And I thought, who would you like to be like in 20 years? In average, if I look around, who would you like to be like? So I started with the prime minister. I mean, I felt, no, but that, uh, I could not resonate with that uh, being, you could say, right? And like that, I went through all the people, all the known people, you know, from uh, uh, the media. And, um, and I just, the feeling of what kind of person to be I could not uh, recognize any of them. I could not see any of them as a role model on a human level. Definitely on a political level, you could say, and with the power they had and the difference they did. But as a human, I could not uh, see. Wow. Yeah, that was quite a revelation for me. And that's also when I kind of decided, okay, this is not the route. I mean, um, I could have continued, right? I was offered seats. Uh, in the national parliament and jobs and the union and all that. But my heart couldn't do it. I couldn't simply do it. Wow. And this idea of helping people and making a change, why do you think uh, people go so wrong? I mean, the whole world thinks of politicians as, you know, self-serving and um, people after power. Why do you think that happens to people? Where does the innocence and the uh, egalitarianism and the, you know, sort of philanthropy go? See, now I'm going to be a little harsh on the Western uh, societies, how we have structured them. Because in my idea, nearly every value we strive for in the West is opposing spirituality. It's like uh, you want to be known, right? You want to be world famous. Your ego wants to be seen and uh, cherished, right? You want to be rich and powerful. And it's in often, very often it isolates you from other people, right? And makes you selfish also on the route. 
it's about enjoyment, sex, drugs, rock and roll. And um, it's not a much about, in my idea, it's not much about moral and uh, values and uh, character formation. It's about the enjoyment, right? And getting the most out of your life. And it's about money and career. And and I don't see really any of these in itself being a goal. And I definitely feel that it's opposing the spiritual journey in so many ways. So I feel the foundation is not, uh, it's not conducive for a harmonious uh, world, I feel, because it's... Uh, individualistic, right? It's centered around the individual that want to get the most out of it. And that there's obviously a lot of conflicting interests the whole time, right? Well, in Denmark, they're pretty good at it, you know, balancing it, uh, in my idea, right? Um, we have that Scandinavian welfare system where mm-hmm. um, a couple of really important things has been decided, for instance, that education is free. That means that not depending on your parents' income or wallet or your own uh, ability to borrow money for that matter is deciding your future. But that you can educate yourself and you can survive for the money that you get actually from the government in the period where you're studying. And it's it's wonderful in the sense that it's built on your willingness and your skills instead of your financial capacity. Or your family background or yeah, any of that. exactly, yeah. That Denmark regularly rates as one of the happiest countries. Also, they have that rating. I don't know how they measure yeah, it. Yeah, sure. They just came out with 2022, and Denmark is second this year, it seems. Yeah. Second to whom? Finland. <laughs> no, but <laughs> all those oh, so Scandinavian... Scandinavia is... The, yeah, yeah. Iceland is third. You know, those wow. Scandinavian welfare states, and uh, Norway and Sweden is seven or eight. I mean, they're all in the top 10, those countries. So why do you think that is, why do you think Scandinavia, what has Scandinavia got right uh, in that sense? Because they're always, Denmark's rated as one of the best places to live, one of the mm. safest places to live, yeah. uh, one of the happiest places to be. What what what, uh, what are they doing right? It's a combination, combination of uh, many things, obviously. But I think, you know, with my political background, I would say that... Um, the labor movements were quite strong in that in in those uh, areas, so a lot of um, solidarity was created. Mm-hmm. So one philosopher he once put it: uh, Denmark is a country with very few too rich, and even less too poor. Mm. And that is put beautifully uh, with the distribution of wealth, right? And the distribution of wealth, if that is equal, the opportunities are also equal. Like we talk education, for instance, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Or if you get sick, right? How will you manage? I mean, will you? Or um, I mean, there are so many kids they don't get proper nourishment in their upbringing, and they get slight brain damages, right? And they don't. They will not have the capacity for the rest of their life to lift themselves to their full potential, as they were given by birth, right? So in in Denmark, there's the distribution is relatively even, and some won't like it, of course, right? But uh, if you are a relatively small country where there's a solidarity around the state, right, and where people are not just there for grabbing, right? Mm-hmm. Now I'm 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 putting this uh, in brackets, right, because Denmark is just half size of Hyderabad, right? Sure, sure, it's really population dark. wise, right? Population wise, is, yeah, less than six million, right? So in India, it's I mean to have the the solidarity with the whole country is difficult, right? Sure, it's such a vast country. So yeah, many exactly. People, yeah. It's just... So it is. You, I mean, when I'm telling this, it might not be a solution for a bigger country or a medium-sized country. Mm-hmm. That's just uh, what I'm putting in brackets here at the same time, right? But the distribution matters a lot, and that we are one tribe. If I should put it a little funnily, nice. That there we are not uh, that different, right? Now, of course, since the 60s, 70s. A lot of um, foreign workers has come, and their their children and grandchildren also growing up. That creates some frictions. But basically, we are one tribe, and uh, we trust the government and support the tax payment. So that means that uh, we can finance so many things. In general, it means that the ninety percent richest richest they pay to the ninety percent poorest. Wow. If you understand that, yes, yes. That yes. means eighty percent are paying to themselves, right? Yeah, the very rich they might not get the amount of benefits they're paying for, right? The very poor they won't pay much, but still they'll get the benefits. But there'll be a kind of a sol- solidarity, 
around the whole system, right? Because the way that it is uh, structured, structured yes. you give, but you also get, and you can see the benefit. It's like an insurance, right? So people are not that uh, distrustful of the government either. In I, that I don't, I mean, in general, I think people believe in the government. Obviously, well, during COVID, there has been a lot of different trends, right? Uh, that's been an up- lot upheaval of, uh, all over the yeah, exactly. world, actually. So yeah. a lot of things have gone, um, you know, upside down. Because it's a small uh, country, and I'm talking politically, but there are other levels to talk also, right? Because it's a small country, it's relatively easy to get political influence also. Sure. And that means people, they consider the political system as something to be strive towards against being against it just, right? Because yeah. you just need 2% of the votes, and then you can actually get a seat in the parliament, as so actually four you will get, right? Some big countries, you have to get 5%, and that's so many votes Absolutely. that it's nearly impossible, right? But it's supporting the democratic understanding, right, that uh, the parliamentarism is the way to change things, right? Not by um, naxalighting or Maoisting uh, some yeah. areas and fighting against people and killing and whatnot. True, true. So... In your career as a politician, which was going on, then side by side, you were also interested in uh, stuff that wasn't visible. The political world is, of course, the visible world around yeah, us. Much. But yes. stuff that is not visible. You you mentioned uh, looking out uh, at UFO listings and things like that, you know, and you know, yeah. checking that sort of stuff out. When did that start? That started right in childhood? or? Yeah, did... I remember some... Uh... I had some experiences in a, in a very, very young age, but a more uh, consistent search started maybe around 10 or 11 years old. And um, I had an experience as 11 year old uh, that I forgot all about uh, until 20 years later. But it was basically um, the first sc- school class we had in geography, we were told to um, we were told there's no class today, you just look in the map. And I was sitting and flipping this book with all the countries and it was just shapes and names and Kuala Lumpur and Kenya. I couldn't make any sense of mm-hmm. it, right? It was just shapes and colors. But suddenly on one page, maybe mid in the book, there was a shape and I was completely drawn to it. It was literally magnetic. And there was one city that I was sucked into, I would say. And I told my friends, you know, we should go here. And they said, why? I said, uh, we can sleep there. And I could hear my own words coming out. I could hear that makes no sense, right? <laughs> I can sleep here also. And uh, it was Chennai. It wow. was The country was India and the city was Chennai, right? And I, um, nobody had spoken about India in my family. Nobody had spoken to me about it or... Uh, um, and then I, I was sitting and brooding, when can I go there? Can I go in 10 years when I'm 21? How much will it cost? Or will I have to be 31 before I can go? Um, how, how much money will I have? How much will it cost? And then I kind of forgot everything about it um, mm-hmm. until maybe a couple of years of practice because I ended up starting in as 31-year-old 30, and I went to Chennai the first time as 31-year-old. Um, so exactly 20 years after that uh, experience It was exactly class. 20 years after, and uh, Charity has written uh, and has spoken about that, um, I think Babadi maybe also, that many times they put the spiritual seed in us 20 years earlier, but it takes 20 years for it to sprout. Wow. Maybe Babadi, he was in Denmark at that time, or maybe he just transmitted at that time to Denmark. But something, uh, I mean, when the, the receptive souls, right, they will somehow pick it up, right? And uh, then it was just lying and working from inside, maybe, right? See, my life as a politician was, uh, I mean, seen from outside, it was like one big, uh, beautiful balloon, right? Lots of colors and ribbons and lights. And it was so flashy, right? It looked so nice. And the balloon was just getting bigger and bigger, you know, being known and getting married with a beautiful woman and all these things, you know, earning a lot of money and being famous and everybody seemed to like you. All those things, it was just a big, big balloon that was growing and growing, right? And uh, the more it grew, the more hollow I became inside. 
the more emptiness I felt inside. Because it just felt like the outer surface, right? Mm-hmm. There's nothing inside. So that um, that longing was there, right? And it's actually when I had, I was in the middle of the campaign politically when one day I put my hand on my heart and I couldn't feel it. It was dead. It was cold. Intuitively, I have always somehow known, I don't know from where, that it had to come through the heart. Whatever it was, it had to come through the heart. And... Um, I was so sad when I realized this thing with the heart. And then there was an inner dialogue. I mean, there was another little voice that said, but what to do? Mm -hmm. And again, the first voice came back and said, I don't know. And in those days, I was was experimenting with a lot of spiritual uh, um, uh, thoughts that was... uh, And I had read in some of the books, I was following some um, Christian mystic uh, group there, and they had read that uh, at bedtime, you can send a prayer to to God, and ask for uh, if it's a, a real wish from the heart. You can ask, right? See, I didn't believe in God. I'm not grown up with the uh, people in my family believing or talking about religion or spirituality or anything with belief. So I didn't know anything about prayer or God or anything, right? Um, so I thought, but it can't it can't harm anything, also, right? If there's no God and you pray, if prayer doesn't work, also doesn't harm anything, right? So I desperately prayed for three nights, actually. If there's anything out there, please show yourself. And then I kind of um, uh, forgot about it. Then I think a couple of weeks later, I met my aunt, and she was talking about meditation. I had tried it before, and it was a little scary for me because I had felt so much change was going on, Mm -hmm. so much that I could not fit in the role I was put in at that time, right? Uh, my whole life had to dissolve and disappear. So I got scared about that, but I called it boring, right? Because no uh, man will admit fear, right? <laughs> <laughs> so so um, I uh, was not much interested. And then she said, on divine light in the heart. I said, what? <laughs> divine light in the heart? She said, I want to try that immediately. I said, and then... A week later, I think I was introduced, and uh, knowing myself those days, I would not have given myself one week in heartfulness. If I had looked at myself, that fellow won't last, no chance. I guess the guys around you probably felt the same. (laughs) I'm sure they, I mean, some liked that uh, suddenly they had a politician coming, showing interest and all that, right? And being very dynamic and... uh, but there was definitely also a fear of the ego that came with it, right? Mm-hmm. And there's no doubt, you know, I knew so many people. And I, I tried everything, right? A lot of egos there. So a lot of cleaning had to go on in me to reach that uh, stage, right? So when I was introduced to heartfulness, I was very systematic. I have this academic background, right? So the first thing was to check the value system. Mm-hmm. And there were four things that was critical for me in the beginning. One thing, it had to be about the heart. That was already a check, right? Second thing was, it should not be a money machine. Sure. And uh, it was clearly said from the beginning, we don't charge anything. Check. <laughs> Third thing was about the master. Does that mean we are slaves? Are we just here to make him feel happy? But as very fast I realized it's just reverse, right? He's here for his master, doing his master's work. And his master's wish is to work for us. So we are kind of his masters, you could say. But we are given what we need, right, on a spiritual journey. Mm. Not uh, whatever we wish as a childish wish. I would want a balloon, right? But it's hollow inside. So... So that was also a check very fast. Then the last thing was really, really important to me, and that was this thing about power use, because mm-hmm. I experienced it so much in politics, maybe also, right, that people use power on you to get you to somewhere where you actually don't want to be, and you might be manipulated into a situation where suddenly you have turned on some people that are your friends also, or that they are saying, this is for your own good, <laughs> <laughs> this is for your own good, <laughs> and... Uh, so that was critical for me, and uh, the beauty in spirituality, which I found out very fast also, is that there can be no use of power at any stage, 
on a spiritual journey. You cannot grow if somebody tries to force you. Mm. And why is that? Well, for the first thing is that when you meditate, you close your eyes. Nobody knows what's going on in there. If you are not interested, it won't be meditation also. So you won't progress also on the journey. So those four ticks was there, right? And then um, I'm, you see, there are three approaches in my idea to heartfulness. There's the karma way with practical experimentation and experiencing. There's the jhana way, which is wisdom, listening to the master, maybe exchanging opinions with the master, reading uh, literature, seeing videos, knowledge. And then there's the bhakti way, right? The devotee way, the love uh, relation with the master and the teacher. So I started very much out as the karma yoga, mm-hmm. as the karma yogi, right? So that was my proof of the pudding, that if I experience, now the value system I had checked, right? So second thing is I need to experience what is going on here. And for that, I also realized very fast, you need to commit yourself to this. You can't take 10% of what they suggest and expect you will experience 100%. It mm-hmm. won't work like that. You take 10%, you might experience 2% also. You might even not be able to register it. Sure. So it was very clear to me if you want to really find out what this is, and this is also a suggestion for all the audience, if you want to really find out what it is, you need to invest yourself. Sure. In some cases we say six months, right? But I think many of us, we are in six months, we're just getting started actually. We don't do the practice properly. We don't have the right approach or intensity. So it will take some time for us to get to that stage, right? And I was dedicated to that. I have always been dedicated to that from the very beginning, that I needed to invest myself in this. And then slowly you started seeing um, results, right? Like the first week I was uh, I was introduced, I became a vegetarian, to give you an wow. example. And you've been a lifelong non-vegetarian before? We are hardcore non-vegetarians in Denmark in general, right? Uh, if there is From not a long non-veg- line of Vikings, <laughs> I mean, we would uh, we were we were non-veg eaters, mm-hmm. hardcore. And if there was no non-veg for a meal, it wasn't a meal; it was just a snack. Now that was really the approach, right? But uh, the, it was cleaned out. The interest was cleaned out. Wow! Within and a week, within the first week, I, I barely noticed it because it just dropped off like a, a leaf falling from the tree, right? Uh, there is nobody jowling, now I'm falling. I mean, it's just a natural <laughs> process, right? But I went to the supermarkets and I was not drawn to the coolers anymore, right? I mean, they, they used to lie in the cooler and say, Dan, we're over here, you like us. Yeah, and we are an offer, Dan, and we are new ones, you have to try us. It just didn't happen. I ended up in the bottom of the supermarket and there were only dal and beans. I didn't know what to do with those fellows. But that's what I ended up putting in the... See, it's not like I was repulsed by non-veg, but it's just like a flower. You don't eat a flower, right? Yeah, sure. It's just not. I'm not drawn to eat a flower, but I like the view of it. No, it's not. Exactly. It wasn't considered food anymore. Wow. And uh, there was no rational explanation for this. Now I can tell you all the reasons, right? But um, so that's the first thing that dropped off. You would say that's incredibly powerful, right? We have a system that simply can alter your behavior in such a drastic way, right? For me, it didn't feel drastic, but I can assure you family members around me, when they realize I can't cook non-veg for Dan when he's (laughs) visiting anymore, that was drastic (laughs) for them. (laughs) So many times I was eating boiled potatoes and lettuce, right? Because (laughs) they didn't know what to do also, right? (laughs) But I couldn't eat uh, non-veg. And then also after some time, alcohol disappeared. We used to party Friday, Saturday. We're young people, right? Yeah, sure. So, but after uh, one and a half years, you know, I. So that's 22, 22 and a half years ago, right? Nearly 23 years ago. I haven't touched a drop of alcohol. I couldn't. That's incredible. The last time I drank a beer was 22 years ago, right? And I had uh, hangovers for three days. <laughs> and I thought, it's simply not that funny. <laughs> that one beer wasn't that funny. Yeah. So, so those are the more crude, uh, rough things that you can observe. Manifestations. And then, of course, there are a lot of much more subtle uh, things like maybe becoming more sensitive, obs- more observant, right? And uh, I started having that experience of love. Mm-hmm. And that is all, uh, in my idea, it's all the blessing of charity. 
that he taught me how to develop that love. And uh, so for me, the proof, as you can understand, the proof was to experiment, test and test and test, to experiment and see how does it actually work on you. But the thing is, that the problem is that you, in the beginning, I couldn't feel my heart, right? Mm -hmm. That's why I joined. The first couple of years when I was doing my practice, when coming out of meditation, I thought I might as well have been meditating on my big toe <laughs> because I had no clue uh, how to connect with my heart, right? But after a lot of cleaning, suddenly I started feeling, I can feel something is being spoken here. Men det var på et sprog, som jeg ikke kunne forstå. Det var en language jeg didn't understand. I could hear words are being told, wow. but I couldn't understand, right? So another couple of years with a lot of cleaning, and suddenly I started being able to hear what the heart suggested. And uh, in general, it was very different than what my mind or my uh, samskaras, you could say, the present samskaras, they were suggesting to do, right? So in the beginning, I didn't trust it, right? Yeah, I it's, could it's, understand, I could hear, I could understand, but I didn't trust, right? Sure. So what do you do then? Yeah, well, I started experimenting again. The karma yoga again. Again, he started experimenting. Follow Let's try it, it. Not follow it. Yeah, try what it. What is the result? That sort of thing? Yeah, and try it. So I had uh, to give you one example, right? Um, one early morning meditation. I was in construction many years, 10 years. And I was way, I finished a project and I was waiting for some land to build. So I had a year or one and a half years. So I thought, what do you want to do? So I sent out that question to Babaji, actually. Uh, what would be spiritual supportive? What kind of job would be mm -hmm. spiritually supportive? That's after the, my political activity, right? So you started uh, Heartfulness when you were in politics, yeah. and then um, maybe a few years down the line you quit politics? Yeah, I I started in 98, right? And uh, I, um, I had, at that time I'd been in politics 12 years, right? Oh, okay. And I had had different uh, positions, but that was in the middle of the election campaign, right? So I was smack in the middle. Uh, uh, the campaign started in 96, right? And it was supposed to end in 99, so four years total. And in the middle 98 there, I got, uh, I I found, or I was found, <laughs> however we put it, right? Yes. Um, so the, And then you have this break of one year after... Um, your construction job and your one. I was ten up. years after that. I was in construction, right? After the politics, okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but the thing is that um, in this process here, when I was waiting for this land, right, I I experimented if I could trust my heart, right. What happened was one early morning, morning meditation, normal day, mm -hmm. the word train driver came, and there was such a peace and calm on my heart. I could hardly remember. And then when I came out of the meditation, my ego was in a complete state of shock. <laughs> train driver. You never spoke about trains. You're not interested in trains. Train driver. So I just left it, right? And then two days later, again in the morning meditation, again the word train driver was mentioned. And this time when I came out of the meditation, the ego was much better prepared. And it just listed up a long of really, really valid counters. I mean, like, you know so many people and you lose all your contacts and all the knowledge you have built, it will be wasted if you go this way. You'll sit all alone up in the front of a train. Nobody will even see you. Well, wow. And uh, I mean, it will be very difficult for you then because you have no interest in any, can, any kind of cars or bikes or trains. You will have no interest in anything of this, right? You don't have any experience with these things. It's a dream job for kids, but... <laughs> yeah. It was, never was for me. Wow. I mean, so... But I knew my heart had spoken, so I applied. There was an education, and I went through all... There was a lot of tests psychologically and and the physical eye test, what not, they tested, right? And then I was hired to do the training for nine months. A lot of stop tests on the way, right? Obviously, because you take responsibility for a lot of human so life, many right? many people, yeah, yeah, you do. Absolutely. So you have to be really sharp and know what you do, right? But I passed it all, and, uh, and why, I mean, how was that spiritual? It's difficult to say, but I was in nature, right? Well. 95% of the time, I was just in nature. I had the best office in the city, right? Because night or day or any season, I was outside, right? And you had I, a window seat. <laughs> yeah. 
I was simply in nature, right? I had amazing experiences with animals and with nature and the beauty of it, right? So maybe that's what I needed, I can't say. And what was the routes you were applying on? The, the I fence? drove uh, in Shelland, where the capital is lying, and uh, basically I checked out where is the least risk for a suicide attempt in front of the train because unfortunately some people use sure. trains to kill themselves. Right? Sure, sure. And obviously in the capital, that's the worst place, right? Mm -hmm. Our teachers used to say, um, it's not a question if, it's a question when you will experience it. Mm -hmm. And that I knew that I will probably never be able to forgive myself because no matter if I had a choice or not, I would always blame myself. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you pull the brake or something you will always come up with, right? So I knew for my samskara, it was important to drive a place. So I chose a small place down south it was just like uh, it was like a triangle. It was just fifty kilometers one way, going back fifty kilometers. Total, it was just the longest stretch were like fifty kilometers. Oh, so nice. it was just bing, 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 going back and forth there, right, until uh, there was an opportunity to um, move to the Danish ashram. You see, some of us on the way, right, we get doubts uh, about the journey we are on, right. So what do we do then? What? How do you go through that doubt? So my approach was always try to take it to the next level. Try and shift to a higher level and see what happens here. What do I mean by higher level? In, in this case here, I decided to apply to move to the ashram and work as a full-time volunteer there. Um, but it can be going now, we have Bandara coming up. It can be to go to a Bandara. It can be to sign up for some volunteer work. Mm. Um, it can to be to take some initiative to present heartfulness somewhere, right? take uh, some responsibility in the center, practical, clean, whatever. You know, try to take uh, your involvement to the next level. If you can do it spiritually, I mean, if you can increase intensity, nothing like it. But for me, it had to be tangible. I need to have a physical proof that now I have taken it to the next level. Mm -hmm. Shifting to India was also that. Coming from Chennai to Hyderabad was also that. Shifting to Kanha was also that, right? It's taking it to the next level. So whenever you have doubt, that is my solution. Take it to the next level, and then you see what what happens. Wow. Well, yeah. So, th so the job as a train driver lasted uh, how many years? Yeah, it didn't last long. I think uh, I started nine months. I think I only drove seven months. Oh, because nice. Then there was an opportunity to shift to the ashram. Oh, and then you shifted to. Brent. Yeah, there was some leadership change in the Danish mission at that time. And then uh, when I was traveling to India, in those days I traveled every three months, stayed one month in India. So I asked Charity if I could shift there and he said, why not? So I came home and informed the, the people that I'm shifting now, I've taken permission. If it's fine with you, I'll come. And how did the family react with the... No, I mean, uh, I didn't have family, right? So in the sense that I was on my own, I sold mm -hmm. a flat and lost a lot of money uh, because of the housing situation at that time, right? But I also realized I cannot wait for these things. You know, if I had kept the flat, I might have not lost that half crore, right? But uh, I could not put my life on hold because of money. Sure. So I sold it, had, took a huge loss, but I shifted to the ashram. And again, it's about take take it to the next level, whatever it is for you. If you have doubts or you feel mm -hmm. it's not um, it's not as intense as it used to be. But with each of these shifts, most of us, uh, you know, I'm speaking for myself, actually. I, I say most of us, but I'm speaking for myself. I would be extremely fearful, too, you know, because it's like a leap of faith, really, that you are listening to the voice of the heart, applying for a train driver's job, quitting the political scene completely, mm -hmm. of which you had invested a lot of your life. Oh, yes. Political scene. And then listening to your heart again and shifting mm -hmm. to this heartfulness center, rats, and uh, being there, um, how did were there were there were there doubts? Did you manage? How did you manage? Was there any fear that I may be doing the wrong thing? I may not be. This may not be the path. But you see, uh, first step was to learn to listen to my heart. Hmm. Once I could hear my heart, I needed to understand what is it telling. Third step was to trust that you can, if you do it, like becoming a train driver. It was very different than. Anything I could have imagined. Mm -hmm. Was it bad? No, it wasn't. It was very different, and in that sense, it was kind of exciting, you could say. Try something, go out of your comfort zone. 
try something new, see what other aspects. And it's, I mean, that's what I'm working with nowadays also when I'm working on uh, memory and concentrating and learning, right? I'm trying to teach people, how do you find a version of yourself where you use all aspects and you use your strength to its limits? Mm. And um, so for me, the fourth step was you can hear the heart. You understand what it says. You trust it. But now you have to act on it, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, tomorrow, yeah, that is there also, right? But you need to have that courage to mm -hmm. take that uh, fourth step also to act on it, right? Yeah, because you could be listening to the heart and it could be giving you very good suggestions. Ooh, but if yeah. you're not listening to it... If, it's not practical. And if you're not doing... Yeah, it's yeah. not practical, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talk sense uh, next year, definitely <laughs> next year. <laughs> no, so that was the challenge I gave myself, right? Yeah. So it's the same thing you could say that I had asked maybe 15 years ago. I asked, I was sitting in a meditation in the Vasana in that uh, ashram I spoke about in Denmark, and the thought was, how do I show my surrender? Because the first seven years I just tested and tested and tested and tested until I didn't know what more to test actually, and then I had that feeling the next one year charity. You decide. Mm -hmm. After seven years, you know, don't take that long. That's what. <laughs> <laughs> don't be as slow as me, right? But uh, that was needed for me. So I had that thought. Okay, how to show my surrender? And at the time, I, because I'm a karma yogi, right? I am a practical yeah, yeah. fellow. It, it has to be tangible. And my thought was, the most intervening thing in my life would be if he chose my wife. Mm. At that time, I couldn't imagine anything more. Uh, uh, anything bigger in my life, uh, life changing, right? So I went to him and I, I asked him directly. Again, you know, I put myself on the spot. The message has come directly. I went to the cottage where he was. As soon as he came out, I asked him, uh, will you find a wife for me? And he patted me on the shoulder and said, when you're ready. And wow. I said, I'm ready. <laughs> but of course, <laughs> when he says you're not ready, yeah, I was not ready, right? So six years ago, I was called here to Kanha, right? And uh, I was told there's a girl here. I want you to meet Master Ask, right? So I came in the morning and uh, I was told, now you sit with the girl. In the evening, you come to Daddy, to Master. And then you decide, what, what are you up to? So I spent half a day on the Babuji statue in the shade with the girl, which I didn't know <laughs> at all, right? Um, we came in the cottage in the evening and... Uh, Master closed his eyes. Uh, then I also closed my eyes. I just felt he connected hers and my heart. Mm -hmm. And um, then I asked him if he had any recommendations for marriage. And um, he gave a few suggestions. One thing was about faith. Another thing was not expecting perfection. Mm -hmm. And um, that was kind of it. Then we walked out. I didn't know if the girl was interested at all. I think she was a little overwhelmed because I was a foreigner and all that, right? She was a Telugu Hyderabad girl, right? And so, language? Was language an issue? I mean... Yeah, man, I, when I came, I, I brought a friend. I didn't know what language she spoke, right? In mm -hmm. case she was speaking Telugu, I, had, I brought a friend that could translate. Luckily, it wasn't necessary. <laughs> but I didn't know, right? So, so I had a few criteria to marry the girl. Obviously, it had to be master's choice. Mm -hmm. Second, the girl had to accept, sure, which is a little critical also. But I also needed the parents to give the blessing because I've seen here in India a couple of my uh, people I know, they suffered so badly yeah, when, when, they went on disharmony. With, yeah, when they went on with marriage and the parents didn't accept. Mm -hmm. So much pain it gave. So I also gave that uh, criteria. So we met on a Sunday, Wednesday, I went and met her parents. Yes. And I thought I would be thoroughly grilled, right, seven generations back. What all have you been up to? What are your ancestors uh, and all those things? But they were very sweet. They're not Abiasis, the parents, right? Wow. They were not Abiasis. I think the only question they ask where is where the father asks where you're going to settle. Mm -hmm. So so from the day we met till we were married, that took 15 days, right? Wow. But again, you were talking about courage, right? What made you do that change? It didn't feel like that for me. It's just like you read a book, right, and you'll flip the page. 
Wow. You don't blow the trumpet. Ta, 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 ta. Now we're going to another page. No, that's just, you flip the page, that it's over that chapter. Now you go to this chapter. It's just like that. Wow. But I think that is, I guess, I hope, that's the heart directing me, I hope. that that's Because it just feels right. It that's just feels right, right? So Incredible, because, uh, you know, the Western world uh, always talks about how weird the arranged marriage situation in India is. But here you are, you put yourself in that position. You put yourself in a position to have an arranged marriage. Which is what brings me to this next thing that I wanted to ask you, which is in the Western world, the idea of surrender. You mentioned surrender. And, the, I mean, your life is... Uh, kind of almost an exploration of the term, you know, how much do you surrender? And uh, it's it's actually a very negative word in the West, you know. A surrender is the, not the right thing to do. You fight the good fight and that sort of thing. You know? mm. But, and especially surrendering, you know, when you have also a human figure associated with it. Of course, the master, when we meditate, we realize that it's much more than just a human figure. You know, it's it's something that is a quality that is beyond description in a way. But uh, um, allowing another human that sort of control in your life is something that people are not very comfortable with. How and I'm sure you weren't to begin with. I'm sure if we met Dan as a young teenager, he would balk at the idea of. Uh, you know, having someone decide who he's going to marry, mm -hmm. having someone decide where he's going to settle. That was unimaginable. I mean, <laughs> yeah. If so, I tell this story to my Danish friends, right, they will think, are you mad? <laughs> <laughs> and maybe I am, but it works really nice for me. <laughs> how, how, how does it, how does one start on this journey? I mean, in the sense that uh, from, this is a, I cannot possibly do this because mm. a lot of people may have an opportunity to experience, to start on a journey of spirituality. But there is that immediate judgment that, oh, um, this means I'm giving up my personality in a way and going to hand over control to someone else. Yeah. How do you get over that? Yeah, I Mene, mean, you can definitely have that approach, but you can ask yourself one question. If you want to be really good at something, what is the shortest route? To find a teacher. If you want to be in any, I mean, in any given thing in school, can you imagine to learn a school without a teacher? If you want to be good at it, you need a teacher. You want to be good in sports? You want to be good in music? Sure. I mean, anywhere there are teachers involved, right? So do you want to be good to follow your heart or grow spiritually? It's, it's just a question you have to ask yourself, do you want to be good at it? Or do you want to experiment al alone, endlessly, and go into labyrinth after labyrinth, not going anywhere, just maybe circling in your life also? I think it's that uh, simple a question. I had this, uh, you know, when I read, in the very beginning when I read the book My Master, I thought it's the most beautiful book I have ever read because it was a pure love declaration from charity to Babaji, mm -hmm. from the third master to the second master when he met him the first time, right? And um, when I saw a quotation Babaji has given uh, that the Westerners always try to find out who am I. They're always asking this question and trying to explore who am I. And he said, forget yourself, and remember him who is all. And those two things, you know, there is such a purity and a beauty in those statements, in my idea. So I have something inside me who is drawing me, which is drawing me towards that kind of surrender, you could say. But um, the journey I took um, in the beginning they are telling that the connection with the master is critical, right? And I'm a karma yogi, so I will experiment. So I really wanted to be a bhakti uh, yogi, right? I'm telling you I, the beauty I could feel in the love relation in my master and in the statement that Babaji gave, right? It was so appealing to me. I had no clue how to do it, though. So when I read my master, I read that Charity looked in Babaji's eyes and he looked into infinity. 
So there was a stage there where I thought, uh, ah, it will come through the ice. I just have to stare at him. <laughs> so in Manapakam, uh, if there was a concert, finally Charity came out. Everybody would turn towards the stage and look at the musicians or the dancers. I would sit ultra. I would sit the other way and stare at Master, <laughs> like a fish swimming <laughs> against the stream. And uh, now you could think, how rude. I mean, how could you do it? How did you, didn't you feel embarrassed about yourself? No. That was the goal, right? Why will you swim this way if the goal is there? That I hope you no... didn't go up on stage and sit next to the musicians. <laughs> <laughs> Once uh, in um, in Gayatri, in Charity's home in Chennai, uh, we were a few handful of people that were waiting for him. He came out after an afternoon nap and sat on his swing. He was a little beside himself right after just waking up. And I was just sitting there and staring at him. And he said, what are you looking at? And I said, my master. And then, poor thing, what can he say? I mean, <laughs> he can't discourage me from that silly, silly route. I had to find out myself, right? So one and a half years, actually, I was like that until something struck me. How rude you are. So it's Have one and a half years of staring at the I bus. stared. Why did I stare? Yeah, because I read in the book, right? Sure. It came through the eyes. I thought sure. it's the souls that meet, right? Sure. But then I, then I understood the, the term constant remembrance, right? I came across that. Remembrance, that's something with the brain, right? I thought. Uh, so it's something about keep thinking about him. Mm. But the pro uh, very soon I realized I can't do that because if I think here, my mind will also jump there. If I'm there, the mind will also, it was just jumping around, right? Mm -hmm. So it was not on one track, my mind. So I realized this is not going to work, right? So what is constant remembrance then? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a feeling, right? It's a feeling of love. And those that you love, your mother or sister or brother or your spouse or your children, you don't need to do any efforts to remember them, right? Maybe especially if you fall in love with a boy or a girl, right? Uh, you are intoxicated completely, right? So I realized it has to come through the heart somehow, right? It has, again, come back to the heart, right? It has to be a love relation, a love journey you take with the master, right? But how can you love an old Indian that you don't know anything about, right? Again, experiment. You know, I I just started observing him, following him, asking him, and testing and testing and testing, and seeing, is he a master? And once I realized he is a master, the second question is there, is he your master? Is it my master? And that too, very, very fast, I realized, yeah. After seven years, just right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's my, he's my master, so... The trust is there. At some stage, it, it, I mean, the love feeling might come in glimpses, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not a steady state, right? But at some stage, it was more like being able to tune myself into his presence, I would call it. If I was able to feel him, even if I was not there in the beginning, right? See, I told you in the beginning I couldn't feel my heart, right? Mm -hmm. Then how can my meditations be effective? Again, I tried to experiment. I read somewhere in the literature, Babaji said, if it comes naturally, you can meditate on the whole physical form of the master, the oh, yes. whole yes. form of the master. So I thought, I mean, this is obviously not working, so the Kama Yogi, he will try, what else can you do to make it work? Um, so I tried to meditate on his physical, I just placed a photo of him, Later, I removed the photo and just had the image. Later, I just felt his presence, right? But what literally happened when I started meditating on his physical form, it was taking a electrical device and putting it in the plug. Wow. It was literally just like this, you know. I sat straight like I was in a, some kind of current was flowing straight to my heart, right? Wow. And when the meditation was over, I kind of just sunk back in, you know. It was so powerful for me to do uh, to do that. And again, you know, if the viewer should take any advice from this, it is if you cannot make something work, try something else that is suggested. Don't make your own ideas, but try and follow some suggestions that are there, because we do need different ways at different times in our in our progress, right? Hmm. Yeah. Sure. So, but that's that's the incredible thing about uh, heartfulness, I think, that it gives you all these techniques and it allows you to experiment with them. 
there are all these set of techniques and you test them out and it's not that uh, anything is being told to accept without questioning you can question everything and uh, also um, uh, get get your answer through experimentation so it's really very practical in that way it's not like uh, there's nothing like uh, deeply secretive or mystical about it it's in in that sense it's more it's out there here is the technique see if this works for you you see my wife calls me a proof fellow <laughs> i need proofs well is she and, referring uh, to the the proof in the alcohol <laughs> <laughs> yeah I man uh, that's also a proof right that it yeah. didn't work for me yeah but that is the karma yoga way i feel right yeah that you test if it works and if it doesn't work you see when we are talking about surrender i had a very very um, private but very powerful uh, experience when i was 7 months uh, into my practice i was a candidate for the european parliament and uh, the serbs had attacked kosovo and they were um, bombing inside kosovo and uh, um, all sorts of horrible things was going on and i had worked in a refugee camp in croatia when the war was going on there in 92 so i started getting the same nightmares i used to have there when the serbs attacked uh, uh, kosovo and after three days and haven't slept at all i decided i need to do something so i took my camera i was also a filmmaker right in those days i took my camera i spoke with all my political connections um we traveled i traveled to italy stayed with some political friends i took a ship over to albania which was the country where nearly all the refugees poured into and i was received by some government uh, people with armed bodyguards and what not that drove me around and they showed me um, a lot of the refugees that had come also to uh, to the capital and um, it was horrible horrible stories right just again reminding of what's going on right now right in many many places on earth right so i told them i want to go to the border station where they let all the refugees in mm-hmm. and they said we can't do that and it's simply too dangerous but i insisted and then i left it and i thought okay it's not going to happen right but i was actually filming to collect money for uh, the refugees right at this stage you have to understand this was on the third day right there were no medias there nobody was giving any attention to what oh. was going on at that it was so early in the process right but i couldn't sleep for three nights for me it felt like an eternity right so finally they gave me a bodyguard who was also the driver they gave me a four wheeler and a translator and off we went uh, up into the mountains the serbs had blocked all the uh, border stations uh, that was easy accessible because they were afraid albanians would attack them so there was only one single place up way up in the mountains on where very poor roads so when we came up there i got away i mean i left the car right and they told 2 300 kilometers of um of uh, refugees are inside uh Kosovo are trying to get out through this border patrol station mm-hmm. right um so i started interviewing some of the refugees coming the other way and uh, and suddenly i had crossed into Kosovo actually oh, okay and i was caught from behind by um three or four uh, serbian soldiers and they were very agitated and uh, they dragged me off took my camera my passport everything i had and dragged me off into the border patrol station and uh, there was one guy in particular he was shouting at me mm-hmm. uh, putting his face his nearly nose to nose and shouting at me right at this time here uh, nato was bombing inside serbia to make them move out right mm, it's a very tense situation it was we were enemies right mm. it was uh, they called me a war prisoner right so it was extremely tense um, and this fellow here i mean he looked like a mad dog i mean if you have seen a rabies dog he had completely mad eyes you know i'm sure he was on drugs for one thing when i'm also completely sure he had killed people he was mm. completely mad and he was shouting at me and uh, nato nato i kill you and uh, i didn't react right at this stage here you know you have to understand i was only 7 months of yes you right but something in me i didn't want to ask for help but something in me just kept repeating may the right thing happen hmm 
whatever that is, and I had no expectation, may the right thing happen in this situation. That I just kept repeating. So I didn't re- react to his uh, shouting, right? Then uh, he pulled out a knife with a blade this length here and put it on my throat, and he kept shouting, right, I'll kill you. And I didn't react to that also. And he got more and more furious, right, because I didn't respond. I, did, I was not f- afraid or what, whatever you call it. Then he took his gun out, right, and put it to my temple and showed with his own head that he wanted he would shoot me in the head, right? And mm-hmm. that too I didn't react on. But then I, I turned my head and looked into the room we were inside, right, and there were two officers there. And when my attention moved there, he was like a balloon. All energy just left him, and he left the room. Then, mm. and then they started interrogating me. These two uh, officers, right? We were sitting at a table like we are sitting here. Uh, one person in front of me, he was just staring at me the whole time. He didn't say one word. He was just reading. Is this fellow lying or what? I'm sure. Mm. And then there was one guy sitting on there. He was asking all the questions, right? Um. And I could not answer, uh, half of them I could not answer honestly, right? Because I would have been used in a political game, right? I would have been a, a, a hostage, yeah. right? Being that a politician in your background. Yeah, yeah. No. So, but what happened very early when we sat at the table, I felt something up, there was a wall here, right? Very close to me. And I felt something, I turned my head and I saw charity. Not like I see you physical, right? But I guess maybe his astral body, but I saw his physical form. Mm. And I was a little embarrassed, frankly spoken, that now I had brought myself in harm's way and he had to come and pick me out. So inside me, a dialogue was going that um, uh, I can handle this. I have been in much worse situations than this, which was not true, right? He didn't say anything, but he just moved inside me. Wow. And... uh, you can call it surrender, right? Because he took over, I felt. And uh, so many things happened. And one of the things, uh, uh, he found that uh, centenary, I don't know if you were there, in 99, when we had the 100 year of the celebration yes, of Babuji, we got a little plastic card for those of us that signed up. And he found that in my wallet. He said, what is this? I said, uh, this is meditation. And then he said, maybe that's why you are so calm. But this is not meditation. This is reality. Wow. And the whole time, you know, it was very, very interesting to see the behavior I had, right? Because everything was conflict, conflict resolving behavior. Wow. I mean, I was the underdog, right? And I uh, said, I'm just a stupid young boy that did a, did a big mistake. I didn't admit I was in politics or I knew anybody. I had to lie about that. I had met with the with the leader of the um, Kosovo Freedom Army also, right? I couldn't tell that. I mean, mm. I had recordings in the car of invi- uh, interviewing uh, freedom fighters on the way, shouting how they wanted to kill the Serbs, right? So all those things there, uh, I couldn't tell, right? But at some stage, and I can only credit it to charity, right? Because at some stage... It was like there was a human connection. Like we have a human connection now, right? Mm. That came with this uh, interrogator, the guy who's sitting and asking all the questions, right? And suddenly I started asking him questions. And he felt like he had to explain. He said, we are not so bad 20 kilometers from, from the border here. We are giving bread to all the refugees. I said, then let's go and film it. I said, hmm. uh, no, no, we can't uh, do that. I said, why not? It'll take us half an hour there, half an hour back. And then you can prove what you're saying. Well, no, no, that's not possible. I said, okay. But suddenly there was a, I mean, the roles was there, right? He was who he was, and I was who I was. But the, a human connection came in the middle of a war zone, right? Wow. Yeah, it was. Um, um, but then at some stage, I was told, you can go now. And they had walked through all my recipes, right? That's where they found the, uh, the receipts, I mean, the receipts I had, my mm-hmm. hundred receipts mm-hmm. I had. Everything they went through, right, and asked, what is this, what is this, what is And then they said, um, you can go now. And I didn't know what they were up to, right, because they had threatened in the beginning that now you are a war prisoner and uh, we will put you in jail for years or something like that if you don't do what we want. And mm-hmm. I didn't, what does that mean, do mm-hmm. what you want? I mean, I didn't know that, right? Or else... 
and I didn't know if that was worse, right? So he said, you can go now, and I didn't know what does that mean. If I get up too fast, will they shoot me in the back, or what mm. does it mean? So I started folding every single uh, receipt one by one while I was talking with him, showing I have no urgencies coming out of the room. I'm very comfortable here. Slowly, slowly, I was packing everything, and then I got slowly up, and I left the room. In the hall, that uh, Matt Rabia's dog fellow, he was there, right? And I knew this is very dangerous. So I reached my hand out to that fellow and said goodbye. I wanted the Rabia's dog to know I'm permitted to leave, right? Wow. And he took, we shaked and took the hand down. I don't know why, immediately again, I took my hand up and I said, my name is Dan, which obviously he knew, right? Because he had my passport. And he, he said, now he was obliged to tell his name, right? And he didn't really want to do that, right? So he said, uh, my name is Soran, which is a quite common name, right? And then I walked out. And uh, a year later when I was uh, flying, I was visiting India, right? I was traveling with Charity, traveling with him. I was in the same flight, right? I was never one who sat on his lap much, mm -hmm. right? I didn't have many personal mm -hmm. interactions in that sense. But I enjoyed very much those days if you could travel with him or just sit for a satsang or whatever, I'd be in his presence. He was sitting way up front in the flight. I was on the very last row. And I had this thought um, that I felt he came into me. I never felt when he left me. Wow. And that thought came in that flight there, and I decided I'll sit and meditate and then I'll ask the question, find the answer from inside, right? And in the meditation, uh, I put this question, um, I never, I mean, I felt when you came inside, I never felt when you left me. And the answer was, I never left you. So you didn't feel it. Wow. And, uh, yeah, but that was the, but you talked, you, because you asked about, it has to be a practical experience with this thing about surrender, right? Mm. So in this situation here, does my ego want to be in charge in this situation, or will it better if I surrender to okay. the master? And yeah, there can be no doubts, right? So you'll only surrender if it's better, right? Absolutely, Isn't absolutely. It? And because this situation was perhaps the worst it could get. I mean, you probably very, feared very for your life it right from the beginning. Dangerous. Yeah, and somebody with a knife to your throat. I mean, you fear for your life right through the situation. So. I didn't do it in the situation, but after it kind of caught up with me, right? Yeah. And it uh, was quite uh, shaken for some time, right? I uh, can imagine uh, anyone would be, anyone would be. And what I, what I, uh, when you, I, as you were relating the incident, what I noticed was that the prayer that came naturally from the heart was not come and save me. It was let the right thing happen. I think that is extremely profound that, you know, the prayer that comes naturally from the heart is not come here and save me. It's let the right thing happen. You see, I think this thing about expectation, right? Because now I'm very boldly sharing my experiences, right? And then some of the audience might think I also have to experience this. No, you have to experience your journey. Hmm. You cannot compare, it's really important, because maybe I shouldn't have shared this also, right? Because you cannot compare your journey with anybody's journey. Your journey is unique. Your connection with the master is unique. If you want, you can also leave today. I mean, nobody is holding your back, right? Mm. Any moment you can walk out. Any moment you can also come back again. <laughs> it's up to you, right? Yeah. Um, but it has to be an individual journey, and you have to make your own experiences and not try to create some expectations. I'll tell you a little experience I had. It's a combination of this thing of having the courage to step up to the master or to take the next step in your life when you feel it's right to do it, right? Uh, we were in uh, Calcutta uh, traveling with charity, right? And um, now again, I'm saying traveling. I was not, I was permitted once in the cottage for a short, uh, brief uh, uh, talk with him, right? But uh, it's not like I spend much, much time with them. I'm just in the uh, periphery, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we came to the airport. We were going back to Chennai, and uh, he was in the VIP section. But then they called and said, now the flight is leaving. And he came out, and he sat just one or two minutes with us. But then the flight was delayed, and suddenly we ended up being just 20 or 30 people spending an hour or one and a half hours with him. 
in these very uncomfortable uh, metal <laughs> chairs that we had there, right? I was sitting on the floor like three meters away from him, and he was sitting up on a chair, right? And then um, those 20, 30 people, everybody had some kind of complaint or some kind of expectation, I felt. Uh, I, My wife died, uh, very sad. And, my uh, daughter is not getting married. My boy is not getting a job. I mean, it was just a request the whole time, something they wanted from him, right? Mm -hmm. And I had this feeling I wanted to make him happy. And uh, what, what, what can I do to make him happy now? To lift the, I felt it was such a heavy atmosphere, uh, atmosphere yeah. because of this uh, baking or whatever you would call it. I understand how serious it was for the people and how much they wished for help. I can understand that, right? But the expectations are keeping him in a cage, right, where he can't do what he might have to do for us, right? So I wanted just to make him happy. So I thought, um, ah, tell a joke. I'll tell him a joke, right? And then uh, at some stage it was a little quiet and I thought, now is my time, I can move up. So I wanted to go up on the knees, right? I came a little close to him. But as soon as I got up on the knees, I was hit with some kind of fear or... Uh, lack of courage, and I sat back down. And I thought, but what is this? I mean, he's sitting right there. You know, you want to be with him. What, what is this? Why Why is your courage failing you? And again, I, I had to make that decision with myself. I need to make, now I have to do it. I can't live with myself if I leave this without uh, doing it. So again, uh, I got back up on the knees, and I got very close to him, like uh, this distance here, right? If you can see this distance, I came close to him. And I started telling this joke here. And I thought it was a hilarious joke. It was a real uh, story also, right? Where my sister had called me a few days earlier and told that she had had a vision. I said, wow, that's fantastic, Trina. What, uh, what was it about? Yeah, but she had seen that when we died, I would go to heaven, but she wouldn't. And in those days, I was a train driver, uh, and uh, she was a priest, Christian priest. And... Um, and I felt bad in my heart. She's my little sister, and I felt no, no, that, that that can't happen. I tried to convince her, and she was very firm. She said, "No, this is gonna. It's that's how it's gonna be." I said, "But how can you be so sure?" She said, "I said, she said because when I'm as a priest, I'm standing and preaching in the church about God. Everybody's just sitting and sleeping. But whereas when you drive the train in the evening." Everybody is praying, God, Dan is driving tonight. Please, <laughs> please help us. So, and of course, that was, I felt it was so funny, right? In the meantime, while I was telling this story, I mean, Charlie did not move his head. I felt nearly like it was, our noses was touching, right? And I felt it like there was a hand through his eyes that came into my chest and was doing some work inside my heart. Wow. And, um, with great difficulty, I was able to keep track of the joke, right? Because you imagine somebody coming this close. And then uh, when the uh, when the, when I was finished telling the joke, Charlie leaned back and he said, joke. <laughs> and not one person laughed. Not one smile, not one laugh. Nothing that could lift the situation, right? And I just sat down, right? And I was very confused about the situation, right? It was little like a cold bucket of water, whoosh, right? Because you expected some kind of reaction. Like you are laughing a yes. little, right? But, uh, but see, again, it's about expectations, right? Because I had an expectation a certain thing would happen. Mm. It's not what happened <laughs> at all. <laughs> but the right thing happened, right? He did the work, right? Yeah. There's no doubt. And maybe because I was so occupied about that storytelling, I gave free passage, right? Yeah. I couldn't focus on having any resistance. So he was just in there and did what had to be done. And then joke, right? <laughs> <laughs> Next chapter. Now, maybe you should have stood up because it's stand-up comedy. It's not knee-down comedy. <laughs> <laughs> knee-down company, yeah. Anyway, Dad, it's yeah. been uh, an hour and 20 minutes that we've been chatting. And I think... Uh, we can pause this session here and I'm sure we'll sit down together again for a, a more deeper exploration of the spiritual journey. It's been beautiful, all that you've shared with us. It's been, it's been I mean, uh, it's been totally heartfelt and uh, it's such a joy to talk with you always. And thank you for taking the time out and let's do this again. 
And I would say to all the viewers also, thank you for your patience and thank you for your patience. And uh, again, you just take what you can use and leave the rest, right? And don't try to compare. It's not about that. It's about finding your answers to the question that you meet on the spiritual journey. And whenever you are challenged and when or whenever you are in a difficult spot, how do you take it to the next level? That's really what it's all about. You have a unique soul and you have a unique journey. We all have the same goal and the same master maybe, but uh, you have to find every step on your own. Beautiful. I wish you all the best with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. That's a beautiful note to end on. Thank you. So that was my conversation with my dear brother, Dan. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. To hear more such conversations, please subscribe to this channel. And also you can find us on Spotify on the KanaCast channel. That is K-A-N-H-A-C-A-S-T. Thank you for listening. This is Hilldog signing off. Woof woof.